Good morning. Absolutely fantastic. I actually well remember you sitting in Parliament uh, on the 16th of April, 1982. And I was reading the Globe and Mail. And at that time, I remember there was actually great apprehension about the idea of the Charter. Certainly, it was something that was very, very hard won in Canada. Uh, and without getting into this too deeply, certainly the Section 1 is, is a testament to that. But what I remember most was that uh, they said that the Charter of Rights, uh, those who were cynical about it, was the greatest make-work project for lawyers of all time. Interestingly, we're here to talk about FATCA today. And as far as I'm aware, this is the first uh, public discussion of FATCA. Uh, which has not been put on by a big four accounting firm or perhaps a law school faculty. But what I'm struck by every time I see one of those presentations, and to quote from one at NYU Law School, they referred to FATCA as the gift that just keeps on giving. And there is no question that that is true for the legal community and the accounting. We have a number of very, uh, I think, well-informed, interesting speakers here today. Um, we'll be going, uh, the first speaker that you'll hear from in a few minutes will be from the Canadian Civil Liberties Union, a lawyer by the name of Abby Deshman. But prior to that, uh, she has asked that the uh, basic stage be set in the form of uh, a, a bare bones, rudimentary understanding of, of what FATCA is, of what it is we're actually dealing with why it's important, because I tell you that if, if, if you can confidently say in five to ten minutes that you understand it better from what I'm about to say, then either I've done a great job or you are an awesome audience or both. Um, but the beginning, the beginning of it really is, uh, is, is the concept of uh, citizenship-based taxation. Now, uh, Mr. Stevens uh, referred to uh, U.S. citizens. Uh, in his opening remarks. And as important as that is, and I think it's, I think often people do think of this term, uh, think of this as something that is really about U.S. citizens, I would like to modify that, amplify, and perhaps correct a little bit. The term is actually U.S. persons. What does that mean? Well, the truth is it means Anybody the U.S. says is a U.S. person, plain and simple. And that, my friends, is part of the problem, which we'll get to as the day goes on. But for the moment, here's what a U.S. person is. And, and by the way, there's probably lawyers in the room. Don't correct me. I'm doing the best I can for a general audience, okay? But it would include, obviously, it would include U.S. citizens, but it goes far more. The, now remember that to include U.S. citizens, uh, dual citizenship is incredibly common. How many people in this room have dual citizenship or a fan? Look at that. Very common. In a global world, possibly becoming the rule even rather than the exception. So the term U.S. citizens, the bottom line is, Nobody knows for sure how many so-called U.S. citizens are in Canada. Nobody's ever challenged the figure of a million. But it's also reasonable to presume that the vast majority of those people are also Canadian citizens and have been for many years, many of whom even, in fact, have been born here and some of whom even don't even know that they're defined by the U.S. government as U.S. persons. Any snowbirds here? Well, that's because you're already gone, <laughs> probably. Because if you were, the US government would say to you that if you spend too much time in the US in any given year, that you're also going to be a US person. Imagine the shock of discovering that on your way back from Florida reading the paper and what that might mean. Ever hear the phrase green card? I don't know if it really is green or not. Yeah, awesome. 
Apparently, this so-called green card is off-white. But what it is, is the, it's, it's the thing that documents that you have the legal status of being a permanent resident of the U.S. And that, by, is, by the way, is something that goes on longer than you might think it does. In fact, there are many people who are green card holders who have not lived in the United States for many years. Because once you get a green card, yeah, you can get rid of it. But it takes proactive, unpleasant work, probably a call to a lawyer and money to do it. This is another example of people who are subject to this who clearly do not live in the United States. So who's a US citizen? Well, on the most basic level, it's defined by the 14th Amendment of the Constitution of the United States, which says anybody born or naturalized in the United States is a US citizen. It is possible to get rid of it, but that requires work as well. So what we're looking at, now, now the U.S. tax system, although it's in a more colloquial sense referred to as citizenship-based taxation, is actually U.S. person-based taxation, regardless of where that defined U.S. person resides in the world, including, by the way, Canada, okay? regardless of whether they have any remaining ties to the United States, property, anything, family, anything that makes no difference. And this is a concept that is really quite foreign to most people's idea of how taxation works because the truth of the matter is that there are only two countries at the present time in the world who tax people who live in other countries, okay? Most countries, the overwhelming majority, tax, they say, well, you know, you live in the country, you got to pay the taxes because you got the services and it's part of being in the community. The U.S. says, no. If you were born in the U.S., if you're a U.S. person for any purpose, you have to pay taxes. Now, you might think, okay, well, what's the big deal? Well, leaving aside the fact that the U.S. Internal Revenue Code and Regulations at 17,000 pages is 10 times, you think dealing with Revenue Canada is bad, is 10 times the page count in Canada, it's even worse because U.S. persons are taxed in exactly the same way with one irrelevant exception exactly the same way as U.S. residents. Now, the U.S. is a country that really doesn't like anything that they call foreign. In fact, if you were to actually look at the Internal Revenue Code in the U.S., you would see that the word foreign, wherever the word forum is, the word penalty is sure to follow. Now, what this means is that a number of day-to-day -day activities that people in Canada and other countries engage in, which, by the way, are heavily promoted by government policy, things as, un as unimportant in life as, uh, as retirement planning, for example, are in fact subject to U.S. tax laws and are taxed in very in, 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 are not recognized as tax-saving vehicles. Now, I'm going to give you one example. I could give you more, but I just want to give you one example to demonstrate the point. As you know, the government of Canada in, 2000, <clears throat> in 2009 introduced something called a TFSA, Tax-Free Savings Account. How many have heard of that? And it is, I think it's very important to understand that this is part of what is considered to be desirable domestic Canadian policy to assist and encourage people to save for retirement. Agreed? Well, let me tell you what that is from the point of the United States government. First of all, it's not recognized as anything. 
Because remember, that U.S. persons are required to file tax returns according to exactly the same laws that people in the United States are. And because there are no TFAs in the U.S., therefore there are no TFSAs anywhere in the world. But under U.S. law, for example, these are considered to be a foreign trust. Now, so what, you ask? Well, in the U.S. tax system, on the one hand, there's the issue of how much tax is owing, but there's another dimension to it, which is used, I think, also, I suspect, to raise revenue. And this has to do with the filing of information returns. Okay, so in other words, it's okay to have a foreign trust, but what's not okay is to not report it to the IRS. Now, you might think, well, well so what? Well, let's, we'll call them up and drop them a line. Not so simple. Very complicated reporting requirements, very complicated forms. For those who are, you know, U.S. tax geek, you may recognize the Form 3520 for those who have been thinking about this. You say, well, so what? I'll give me the form. I'll fill it out. You will not be able to fill out this form without professional help totaling thousands of dollars if you can even find that kind of professional help in this country. And the penalty for non-willful, $10,000. How many think that's absolutely outrageous? You do? Well, you're not going to believe what I'm about to tell you next then. Because it's a foreign trust, and you know, the one thing, the U.S. tax system is based on a system of complete distrust, they want verification of that from what's called the trustee. Now, in people talk, that means if you have a TFSA at, say, the Toronto Dominion Bank, the Toronto Dominion Bank would be, would be the trustee, and the trustee under U.S. law, imagine this, okay, under U.S. law, the trustee, the TD Bank, is required to file with the IRS a form which essentially duplicates your form to essentially just validate, okay, that in fact you're telling them the truth. I think, well, you think the TD Bank's going to do that? How many imagine they're going to do that? No, they're not. Well, problem is this, two problems. The first is your tax return, if you were living in the U.S., is due April the 15th. For people outside the country, you can get, it's June the 15th. And you can get an extension till October. Okay, if you don't owe them any money, we'll get to that. I see you've had some problems here. Okay. <laughs> I'll be interested in hearing later. Um, if this form is not filed by March the 15th, which, by the way, is well before the due date of your tax return, then you, not the TD Bank, you are subject to another $10,000 penalty. Okay? Now, I'm going to discontinue the discussion of the forms and the penalties in a specific way, but what I want you, what you need to understand for the purpose of this whole discussion today is that when we're dealing with the U.S. tax system, we have taxes, which you understand. I mean, there's nobody in Canada who could not understand taxes. How many think they are high? Oh, you don't. Okay. But what you don't understand, and what's left out of the discussion, is the information returns, which are actually the bigger problem, A, because nobody knows about them, and B, because... I guarantee you, and I will stand by this word, I would rarely use the word guarantee, that nobody except a person who does not own anything except the shirt on their back could afford to file a U.S. tax return for under about $3,000, and I don't care who you are. If you have anything, okay, if you have anything, it's going to be much more, and I know somebody personally who filed a U.S. tax return in 2011 that was almost 200 pages of information returns. Very middle class person as far as I can see, unless there's some stash that he hasn't told me about, in which case I don't think he'd be telling to the U.S. government either. But my point is that we are dealing with a tax system of enormous complexity. I've heard it referred to when it's applied to U.S. persons abroad as a simply nothing more than a tax and penalty club. 
Now, this is important to understand FATCA, moving back to the main event. The purpose of FATCA, and what I'd like to do is show you a one-minute clip, okay, of the sort of philosophical origin of it, and here we go again. Now, we have a surprise guest speaker today. Um, how many recognize him? Uh, before he was uh, a president, he, well, the year he pretended being a senator while he was running for president, um, he did co-sponsor with Senator Carl Levin something called the uh, Stop Tax Haven Abuse Act. Um, in any case, this is from a White House press conference in 2009. It's actually 10 minutes. I just want to show you one minute of this. And I want to show this to you because what this really is, it predates what FATCA became, okay? It provides the philosophical justification of this, if you will. Okay, so here we go. Now, for years, we've talked about stopping Americans from illegally hiding their money overseas and getting tough with the financial institutions that let them get away with it. The Treasury Department and the IRS under Secretary Geithner's leadership and Commissioner Shulman's are already taking far-reaching steps to catch overseas tax cheats, but they need more support. And that's why I'm asking Congress to pass some common-sense measures. One of these measures would let the IRS know how much income Americans are generating in overseas accounts by requiring overseas banks to provide 1099s for their American clients, just like Americans have to do for their bank accounts here in, in this country. If financial institutions won't cooperate with us, we will assume that they are sheltering money in tax havens and act accordingly. And to ensure that the IRS has the tools it needs to enforce our laws, we're seeking to hire nearly 800 more IRS agents to detect and pursue American tax evaders abroad. I know I've heard enough. Have you? This is real. At the start of the press conference there, there were three people standing there. Uh, President Obama was introduced by Timothy Geithner, okay, as you may know, as the Treasury Secretary in the U.S. Yes, well, I did not, that comes from you, not from me. Okay, notorious tax evader. Usually I hear, I hear him referred to as a tax cheat, but okay, all right, I'll, I'll take that, okay. And... Um, Douglas Shulman, who is the, uh, the IRS commissioner, okay, so this is sort of a three-part presentation. Now, in that one-minute clip, it would seem to me that the mindset of the U.S. government is there's a pretty clear association with the bank accounts outside the U.S. and tax cheats. How many would agree with that? I mean, there's really no other way to interpret it. I mean, it's, it's, it's absolutely astounding. It's absolutely astounding. Now, that was in 2009. Now, on to FATCA. FATCA is not a statute by itself. It stands, by the way, for Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act. Other people have put together different acronyms for it, but we'll, we'll leave that aside for the moment. It is not a separate piece of legislation. It was part of, it was sort of, it was part of a massive piece of legislation which was signed into law in March of 2010 called the Hire Act. Now, basically, the Hire Act was well, you know, an attempt to promote jobs and things like that, and perhaps as a noble purpose. Now, the rumor is that this was actually s sort of slipped in in the last minute, and like all legislation, it's hugely complex, and I think it's entirely reasonable to believe that most members of Congress didn't even know what they were signing, you know, and if they did know what they were signing, I find it very difficult to believe that any, any rational person would sign that quickly without seeing what the implications were. In a very real sense, it reminds me of Obamacare, which was, you know, signed into law without uh, a lot of people reading it. I mean, Congress, men and women, frankly admitting that it was too long to read, and Nancy Pelosi uh, famously saying, well, it's, it's important that we sign it into law so that the American people can see what's in it. I kid you not, I won't show you that video because it's a bit off topic, but I, all this is, I'm not making any of this up. Bottom line is that in fairness, in fairness, okay, to members of Congress, 
I don't believe they knew what they were signing. Now, in its simplest terms, and this is the challenge, as I was talking to Professor Christians outside in the hall, this is the challenge to actually explain what in God's name this is, other than a permanent revenue source for the legal and accounting community. Now, as Mr. Stevens points out, the first thing FATCA is, is a law that is designed to apply extraterritorially. Now, in people talk, that means, you know, in the same way that uh, the U.S. is sending drones into sovereign airspace once a week, they're also sending their laws into sovereign countries. In this case, this law has two distinct components to it without getting into too much the detail of either one. The first is it applies to, I'm just going to say the Canadian banks, although more is involved. That's because everybody can visualize a bank, the Canadian banks. Now here's what it's telling the Canadian banks. Okay, it's telling the Canadian banks that you know what? Okay, here's what we are asking you to do. We are asking you to take proactive steps at your expense to root through your databases and determine and identify anybody who's using your bank who meets our definition of U.S. person. And that, by the way, would include your friends, neighbors, and I suspect maybe some of the people in this room. Okay? Now, you know, it's like I explain this to people I know in the U.S., and, and they look at me as if I'm out of my mind. I'm used to that, by the way. Okay? And the obvious question is, you're kidding. Why in God's name would anybody do that? Well, here's why. Because what the law says, that if you do not, not only do you have to do it, but you have to enter an agreement specifically with the IRS, Internal Revenue Service, who's been delegated the authority for this, like so many things. Amazingly, you know, you heard President Obama say they'd hired 800 IRS agents on, you know, on this offshore thing. Well, you know, the, you, know, you know the second motivation for hiring a number of new IRS agents in the U.S.? Obamacare. You know, I mean, it's amazing. U.S. gets public health care. First thing they do is go out and hire a bunch of new IRS agents to enforce it. Unbelievable. But if you don't enter into this agreement with the IRS, what they are saying is, now listen to me carefully, because I think this is put far too charitably in the media. Any payment in U.S. dollars going to your Canadian bank, notice I'm not talking about profits, right? Am I right on that? From anywhere. Glad to have your vote on that. But no, it's interesting to me that I think that people undershoot the mark. You agree when they describe this. Any payment. Are you ready? We're going to deduct 30%. Now let's just imagine. Now, and by the way, this is to the bank irrespective of the account holder. All right? Are you getting what I'm saying? So in other words, okay, again, I'm going to put this again. If the bank does not sign the agreement with the IRS, any payment in U.S. dollars, regardless of the reason and regardless of who the ultimate payee is going to be subject to a 30% courtesy deduction. Can you get the money back? Probably, you know, if you want to go to the trouble of filing. Now, in the press release, which the Progressive Canadian Party put out, I think I saw the word extortion in that. Did I see that in the press release? Yeah, I, think so. <laughs> I thought so. Right? So in other words, it's not clear to me that this is really a voluntary agreement. I, it reminds me, I think, of a little bit of a scene from The Godfather 1, something about your brains or your signature on the contract, all right, or something like that. But this is incredibly serious, and it's incredibly serious for reasons that go well beyond, okay, you know, just the sort of issue of sovereignty. Now, we're talking about identifying these so-called U.S. persons. Later today, I'm going to show you another video from a bank, a bank training video on how to find these people, and I promise you, you will be shocked. You will be shocked.
Okay, this is on a par, okay, with things that perhaps were going on in the 30s in another part of the world, okay? Now, in a moment we're going to hear about, I think, some of the very obvious privacy issues, okay? In a moment we're going to hear about that, okay? But, you know, I want to ask you a simple question. How many of you think that it's a good idea to let the IRS tell Canada how it should run its banking system? Nobody? Huh. Doesn't surprise me. What's that? Okay. Now, the second prong to FATCA is this, all right? I mean, you know, when the U.S. goes to war, I mean, it really goes to war. We've got the war on drugs. We've got the war on terror. We've got now the war on offshore tax evasion. And by the way, how many of you, when you look in the mirror in the morning, see a tax evader? Very hard to be such a person, I think, in a country like this with such A, high tax rates, and B, easy ways to track money. I, not, not that I know any, any money launderers anyway. I don't, for the record. But I would be very surprised if one of them decided to open an account over here at the TD Bank. Okay, very surprised. In any case, now, remember that the U.S. person's in the obligation to file these tax returns and these forms, okay? The second prong of FATCA is, you guessed it, another form, okay, another form for U.S. persons to file. Now, this is a form that is incredibly intrusive, and to put it very simply, it spells the end of financial privacy. What it is, in effect, is a form where the clear both purpose and effect is to register each and every asset that you have under the sun. Once registered my prediction down the road, what's to prevent outright confiscation? But in any case, this is a requirement of registration. By the way, do you think there's a penalty for not doing this? What do you think, yes or no? You're right, there is. What's the default penalty for not filing a form? 10,000, good, but it's worse because if within 30 days of having been notified you haven't filed the form, it's now 50,000. Now this particular form has a cousin, okay, which is called the FBAR, Foreign Bank Account Reporting Form, which we're not here to talk about FBAR today, but those of you who have learned, recently met Mr. F. Barr, will recognize him as one very nasty piece of work with the potential to more than bankrupt you. So this is what's going on. Now, final thing before I turn this over to Abby is, you know, it's one thing to think of this in some theoretical way. It's one thing to think of this as somehow this affects you know, U.S. citizens who are here for a couple years. It doesn't. Okay, not only does it affect Canadian citizens, but I want to make the point that assuming the correctness of the million so-called U.S. persons in Canada, it is far more significant than that because U.S. persons often have spouses who are not U.S. persons, are members of families who are not U.S. persons, and when these fines are leveled, you make no mistake, you make no mistake, they are moving in the direction of levying these fines, and they are being very public about it. This not only will have a disastrous effect and is an attack on a family of Canadians that does not, that includes far more than U.S. persons, but in addition to that, what it does, assuming these, these, uh, these taxes and fines are paid, is a way of the U.S. government putting their hand into Canada and simply bringing it back full of Canadian dollars that were not earned in the U.S., have no association with the U.S. or anything remotely close. And there's a word for that in the dictionary. It begins with T, I think. Any thoughts on what that word might be? Answer? Theft. What? All right. If you buy into this story, We've got a great list of speakers here today to take you through the ins and out of that. And the first one uh, we have today is Abby Deshman. 
who is with the Canadian Civil Liberties Association, who very recently uh, wrote a letter, I, I believe it was to, uh, to the Department of Finance, and nobody in particular, I think, but to the Department of Finance, um, I, I, I think complaining about, uh, complaining about this, to put it, to put it charitably. Um, Abby is a graduate of the University of Toronto, also a graduate of the University of Toronto Law School, an LLM in international law from NYU. Uh, by the way, the, uh, the graduate tax program at NYU is where you find, uh, including, I think, professor, professor Christians as well, right? also a graduate, the LLM tax program of NYU, which, as far as I can see, is a virtual monopoly, okay, on what's going on in this area. But in any case, let me turn you over to Abby. Abby, thank you so much. <laughs>